I introduce it or you are going to introduce it? You go what? ahead and introduce your okay. part. And who, okay. Who you are. Welcome to Annie M's Attic. I'm Ann Walter and this is my love. My love of history, my love of women's history, and of course the fashions that impacted women and how women impacted the fashion. So this is really a hobby that started way back in the 60s. You know, uh, why other friends were uh, cruising Maine, I was in antique stores or secondhand stores. Nobody else would go with me. But some of these beautiful hats you see here that are worth several hundred dollars, I bought for a quarter in a bushel basket because I loved history. And I was so curious about women in history. Started with my grandmother, both grandmothers in fact, Grandma Bryce, and Grandpa Bryce were silver miners in Silver Plume, Colorado, Georgetown, Cripple Creek. Um, actually, Grandpa went through the Cripple Creek Gold Strike. And then my Grandma was born in a mining camp. And so I got interested in how she survived the mining camps. And then I got interested in how she, um, how she raised her children, the hardships she had. And so that started the whole interest in women's history. My other grandma, Grandma Henry, was actually born in Denver, but my great-grandmother came to Denver in a covered wagon. And so I was so fascinated by my Henry side of the family. And so now the, the, um, the tea room is accented with aprons because Grandma Henry loved aprons. So that's what started it. And I started collecting by beginning with my mother giving me my great grandmother's bonnet. Mm. Now these weren't called hats, these were bonnets. As you can see, the bonnet sat to the back of the head and then uh, was raised forward, of course tied around their neck. But you notice that all the beautiful hats had uh, silk, satin bows, rosettes, and in this case beads, and oftentimes uh, jewelry adorned their hats. So this is very old because my grandmother was born in 1879. This was my great grandmother's. So it's very, very old. And then, uh, Lori, if you look up there, you'll see a couple, a couple other examples of my great grandmother's uh, hats and fashions. And then my grandmother, <clears throat> this is one of her hats. And well, I'm sorry, I'm referring to them as hats and they're not. They are called bonnets. But this is another one that you see. He has the rosette, has the lace, and has the beads. But I also want you to realize that women were carrying six to ten pounds of weight with their dresses. In, you know, including the dress sometimes weighed six pounds itself. And then they had, of course, their, their hoop skirts, their uh, corsets, their bustles. And most of them were formed with wire or iron or steel. So you can see inside this hat, it's all uh, wire, which only makes the hat, forms the hat, because milliners would start with the form first. They would design the hat with the wire first and then put the fabric on. So we start with that six to 10 pounds of weight starting with their hats, because they had wire in their hats, they had wire in their stays, they had wire in their hoop skirts. So women were very uncomfortable, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but they carried a, a lot of weight around on very tiny little shoes. So this was another one of my grandmother's. Now I'll show you another hat as we go as she progresses and gets older, um, <clears throat> but many of these are your old uh, late 1800s hats. This is another one and I enjoy this one because this shows you the wire. See this is all wire but it's made out of horse hair and so is this one. This is all made out of horse hair and these were this was of course a, considered a bonnet. This was considered a hat but um, this is kind of not a very attractive <laughs> bonnet but I love it because it um, has the horse hair and then also it has a crown Whoops. this large crown because my grandmother told me that when she was young she could sit in, in a rocking chair and she could flip her hair down and it would touch the floor mm -hmm. so the women had lots of hair they did not cut their hair they always had the long hair but in order to 
uh, keep their hair and be able to be functional, they wrapped it all up in buns. And that's why you see the big uh, crown. You know, that's where the, the hair went and, and that helped hold the hat on. Okay. <clears throat> then um, as we progress a little bit more, uh, there were fancier hats with the feathers. Now, that's what's interesting. Um, thousands of pounds of feathers were, were exported from um, Africa to the United States uh, during this period, or late 1800s, late, uh, well, the 1800s, late 1800s, and the plumes were worth a lot of money. I always tell the ladies that come into the shop that uh, the second most expensive budgeted item was the hat. I think that's amazing. I guess they probably bought food for their husband and children, but the second most expensive budgeted item was the hat. That's how, not only how special it was, but it was very expensive to have a fancy hat. The plumes cost a great deal. So they fluffed up their hats. You can see in all kinds of shapes of hats with all the plumes, the flowers, the rosettes, even the nightcaps, even the nightcap had a little bit of a rosette on it. Um, then we go into another hat that's kind of sp very special to me is that, and that's this one. This was my great, my grandmother, Grandma Bryce's, and Mom ha held on to this for quite some time because it was so, so important to Mom, uh, but it does indicate the Victorian hat. Again, you can see it's built around wire and it's velvet, but what we like so much about it is that Grandma had a uh, plume holder. <laughs> so you see, she could change the color of her plumes to go with her dress. And I have yet to see another hat that has that. But that's what made it so special for my mom because my grandmother tried to be very fashionable even though she was born at a very difficult time of women's history. Okay, we're another one. We're going a little further into the uh, era that we're getting into the early 1900s here. And this is a buggy hat. Okay, these hats were worn and I have pictures of everything here shows you in their Model T's or their wagons. Um, they, or here's one right here, a couple of them that show women in their buggy hats. Oh, sorry. But the buggy hat was very important because they still wore the hat, but they had the ties. Oh, sorry. They had the, of course, the tie around it, and then that way it would hold on in the wind or the weather but they always had their hats. So there's some cute pictures over here, one in Georgetown, Colorado, uh, where the women are wearing their buggy hats. We'll get pictures of those later. Yeah. Okay, now we're gonna turn real quickly here because we're gonna show you a couple of uh, uh, fashions here that correspond. Now this is one, excuse me, Lori. This is one of my oldest ones here. This is very rare in the fact that the bustle was actually built in behind. You can see this opening. Now the bustle itself has dissolved, um, but it was actually put in there. And so she had the bustle she carried along with her dress. And then when she sat down, it would collapse. And when she stood up, it would fold up. And so that's called a bustle dress. And again, I've never seen one with the bustle built in. Now these two dress, well, there's a whole nother era of women's history, and that's when they were in mourning, but I'll tell you that in just a minute. This is a beautiful wedding gown. Now, this is, comes up more towards the 1900s, late 1800s and 1900s, and the skirt now, the, uh, the hoop skirt is gone. They're still wearing the bustle, but the dress becomes more slenderizing. This beautiful piece came from France, and it is pure silk. I had a friend, Yvonne Larson, who came to look at this dress to help me date it. And she took a little string off of the sleeve here, took a match to it, and the, uh, the silk dis disappeared, totally disappeared. And she looked at me and she said, that is an indication that this is pure silk. Because if it had been manufactured silk, it would have curled, but it dissolved. So this actually came from France. This is a typical hat of 
of the big Victorian days that would have corresponded with this type of dress. As you see, lots of beautiful feathers and jewelry, uh, lace and so forth. The hats were very big and very cumbersome, actually. That's why we always wear our hats tilted because we could, sometimes you couldn't get through the doors. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you always tilted your hat just a little bit. Uh, but again, like mine, it was adorned with all kinds of, of feathers and so forth to, to um, match. Because the woman, you know, never went out without her hat, her gloves, and her purse and her shoes. Uh, in fact, the, the hat was so important to the woman that it was part of her personality. Later on, I'll, I'll quote some history for Lori to give you more accurate um uh, examples of history for the women, but this was this was an important part of their lives. And notice they're dressed, they're dressed from the top to the bottom. No skin showed uh, except their faces. In fact, I should be wearing gloves, but it's easier for me to work with the clothing uh, without my gloves. However, you know I should be wearing them due to to protecting them, but. Um, they did. They wore gloves. They wore their hats. Nothing was showing but their faces, their shoes. Now, I want to remind you that they were walking on six to ten pounds of weight on shoes like this. In fact, there's an older pair over here that I'll show Lori later. But that just amazes me. Now, we can go into all the health issues of women during this period of time. You know, of course, the corset, you women all know about the corset, but the corset was actually very unhealthy. It uh, constricted the woman's inner organs, especially young women who were developing their livers, their kidneys, their lungs. Uh, many women actually, there was, it was not polite to converse much when they were a young lady, but probably uh, one of the problems was she couldn't because she couldn't breathe. They were so constricted that they had trouble breathing, and of course that affected their lungs. Um, so it was very uncomfortable, and the fainting couch was manufactured because the Victorian woman, if she fainted, she, could, she couldn't sit her down. You had to lay her down. Also, one little fun little thing is a tussie mussy, and there's one over there. But a tussie mussy was uh, worn by the women uh, not, excuse me, not worn, but carried by the women because of two reasons. One, they didn't smell very well. You have to remember they didn't have the water sources we have, and so they didn't smell very well. Uh, so if there was a young man who was going to approach me, I'd have my Tessie Mussy, and it could be actually manufactured, or it could be a hanky filled with flowers, but inside was smelling salts, and perfume so she might wave it around so she smelled better and then if she got to feeling a little lightheaded she'd sniff and it would wake her up so you know it was very difficult to be a woman in that period of time they were very constricted i don't know if you remember uh downton abbey and mary and you can see that if you go back and look at some of this uh sessions that after the 1900s into the 20s when the dress became very lightweight, very short, their arms showed, uh, she becomes involved in the business of the farm. And we say, oh, that's interesting. She must have been a leader. Well, she was, except she could breathe. And that meant her brain was functioning. <laughs> Unfortunately, for many years, women were you know, constricted, not only their bodies, but their brains, because their brain was not getting the adequate oxygen they needed. <laughs> So you can see how women begin to surface, the women's movement and everything, because they're not constricted anymore. So um, I think that's kind of interesting, you know, that we, fashion was so important that you actually could die from the fashion. Well, as a matter of fact, number one reason for a woman's death in those days was childbirth, which we can all understand. The second reason most women died was fire their dresses caught on fire. Mm. And, you know, you can imagine passing by the, um, uh, the campfire or the stove, whatever. You know, it would be easy for your dress to catch on fire. 
And the trouble was they were so bound that you couldn't get them out of their clothes fast enough. And so many women died because of their clothing. And so we need to remember that as part of their history. You know, it was hazardous for your health and your well-being to be dressed like this. But it was fashionable. And so we did it. <laughs> now, this is kind of interesting period of time real quickly. <clears throat> well, just a minute. I'm going to have to move this This period of time of the women was mourning, the mourning period. You have to remember, you have to remember that, you know, women were in mourning most of their lives because they lost husbands, they lost children. And so they were in mourning. Now, my research, and I know there's different uh, opinions on this, but my, in my research, it said women mourned for 30, for, yeah, 30, 30 weeks. Yeah, 30, I'm sorry, I had to think, I want to be sure. Anyway, they, they uh, mourned for a great deal of time, and in doing so, they wore black. Now, the reason for the black was, of course, to be respectful for their loss, but also Queen Victoria wore black for most of her life, the reason is that she was in love with her husband. And when he passed away as a young man, she never got over that loss. And so she continued to wear black. And so the English women then would pattern after her and they would wear black. So between the Queen of Victoria's lifestyle and the actual tragedy of losing families, women wore black a lot. Um, now this, this is a pretty typical uh, morning dress, although when I looked at it the first time, I thought, hmm, well, she's kind of happy. <laughs> but the reason is, is because basically they had one black dress, one black skirt. They say, you have to remember, they couldn't afford a lot of clothes. And um, so they wore a basic black dress, and then this is an overskirt that went over a plain black skirt in order to dress it up for a more important occasions. Now, I'm wearing an overskirt, but mine is a replica. This is not, I had this made several years ago, so it's almost vintage. But it, the overskirt helped the ladies change the look of their wardrobes uh, because basically they had very little, um, very few clothing, very few fashions to wear. So this is beautiful though, if you look at it. This was a morning dress. See the beautiful trim, silk, it's all silk. So really they were, even during this sad period in their lives, they were very, very lovely. Now this is another, well, there's a big one, uh, a very beautiful one back here that maybe Lori will take pictures of later. But this is what I wanted to show you. This is one of my favorite dresses. Isn't it just lovely? <laughs> I'm looking at Lori's face and she's going, what? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I found this in our little, our sunflower antiques in Barnes, which I love to go shopping. And I, my daughter found this, and she said, Mom, look at this dress. And, of course, we took it out of the box. And um, Melody uh, Sedevi, who owns the antique store, was standing there watching me. And I said, oh, yeah, well, yeah, well, you can see the white. And I was telling you about mourning. They have half mourning. Half mourning meant that you could wear grays or dark navies. It meant that you could put a little lace on your collar or lace on your sleeve. That indicated you were coming out of mourning. So I was thinking, well, now that's that's unusual. You know, here's the lace and everything. But I kept looking at it, and I finally pulled it out of the box, and I went, oh, this is a burial dress. This is what the uh, undertaker would put over the body of a woman. Now remember, all women, even when they 
after their death wanted to look fashionable. So if they couldn't afford a nice dress, the undertaker would put this over the body for the funeral and then take it off. And then of course the casket was closed and she would be buried, but this is a burial dress. And I remember Melody's look on her face. I went, this is a burial dress. And she just smiled at me and said, yes, it is. And it's all hand, hand sewn, as you can see. Yeah, see all the stitching, look at the. But I, I laugh because, you know, I mean, it shouldn't laugh, but I smiled, I'll just say I smiled because, you know, that was so important for a woman even to be buried in finery. And so this is a burial dress. <clears throat> now we're going to slip over here to some more hats for a few minutes because this is basically your from your period of 1850s where Lori let me have you step over here and look here there's two more dresses that are important this dress has been altered but this is an uh, 1860 Civil War gown it has been altered I evidently made into a costume. <clears throat> I found found this online back east. But it's beautiful satin. The braiding, the buttons are just gorgeous. Can you hang on to this and hang on to your camera at the same time? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick. <laughs> I wanted to, to see. Uh, I wish you, I could have should have taken the picture. <laughs> of Lori's reaction, this is very, very heavy. And then, as I said, six to 10 pounds of weight. So you can see this was one of those six pound dresses. Now remember, she's got at least six petticoats under here because women are re were the first to recycle. They would put the, the petticoat that was next to their skin uh, with soil. So they take it off and wash it and then put it over the top so that they actually had about six petticoats on at the same time to help flare their dresses out or their uh, skirts out. So you can imagine the weight that they were carrying, plus the wired hat, the stays in the bustle, or it stays in the corsets and so forth. But this was very, very old. Uh, it has been altered, however. Now this one was the oldest I have in the shop. This is an 1850s dressing gown. I found this in Manhattan, and I had a friend who had a little antique shop. She called me one day and she said, Ann, I think I have a beautiful dress, a couple beautiful dresses for you to look at. So I went down and she brought it out, and of course I went, oh. and you gotta be careful when you're buying clothes, you don't want to be too excited <laughs> because the price might go up. <laughs> but I, I knew I knew her well, and. I said, oh, that's gorgeous. And she said, well, I thought you might like it. And then there's another one hanging over there. That's the same period of time. This was 1850s. All right, this is sugar sacking. This is all made by hand, as you can see. Look at the gorgeous buttons and the trim. These are pagoda sleeves, which is one reason it's dated to 1850s, thanks to Yvonne Larson. Um, but this is just gorgeous, and I was like, oh, and this is one of two. And so I looked at her, and I said, Regina, I, I don't know if I can afford it. How much do you want for these? <laughs> she looked at me, and she said, $10? And I said, really? Oh, she said, you know, if I put these out in the shop, the K-State girls will buy them and use them for Halloween costumes. So she said, I knew this was rare. So she said, I saved it for you. Thank heavens, because this is 1850s dressing gown. It would be like we wear a robe today. You know, they put on the dressing gown uh, before they uh, would go out, you know, over their uh, underclothing uh, pro uh, before they put on their beautiful gowns or beautiful dresses. So that's 1850s. Now, we're not going to take time because we could go through all of this, but there's a corset covers. There's the uh, beautiful uh, underclothing. Here's the very, very old hoop skirt. Again, remember, the hoop skirt has uh, wire in it. So, again, this was hanging on down on them with wire. Uh, this is a bigger hoop skirt. 
Um, let's see. I love this one. If you remember the movie, um, oops, let me get in here. If you remember the old cowboy movie, all right, remember all oh, cowboys coming down out of the hotel and his, the girl, the woman's running down the street. Remember John Wayne and McClintock? I saw that movie, and of course, I love John Wayne. My dad took me to every John mm -hmm. Wayne movie there was. But I found this, and I went, oh my gosh, that's what she was wearing in the movie. This is some of her underclothing. What's interesting is that. Isn't that beautiful? Right there, yeah. Ooh, got some. And these are, of course, they had um, pantaloons or they had drawers. Now, these were called drawers. Your pantaloon were like these, where it's much fancier. You know, your pantaloon was very fancy. This is probably where you wore out, where the um, the drawers where you wore in the house, around the house. Oh my goodness, there's so much here. Lori, I don't know how I can tell you all. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have Lori back up because now we're going um, into a whole change. In fact, if you could kind of swirl around this way and go back to the clothing and maybe shoot in on these two dresses. The reason I'm having Lori do this is because I want you to see the contrast. These, these two came in the early 1900s, that's the 1880s. So you can see how they're covered again from top to bottom. And then, the 1920s. So I'm going to have her kind of turn around here because the fashion totally changes for women. I often wonder what the Victorian grandma must have thought of the teenage flapper because she was uh, talking about, you know, showing skin. Uh, here's some examples of flapper dresses of the 20s. Things changed drastically. My daughter is very small. And I had her get in this dress, and as you can see, we had to open the seam to get her in. That's how tiny they were. 16 to 18 inch waist. Now, of course, they're not wearing a corset here. The corsets are gone, the bustles are gone. The woman is now just wearing a, a very nice slip, we call that now, the slip, uh, because this was very important to cover up a little bit anyway. Oh my goodness. <laughs> because there's a flapper dress. I've had young girls come in the shop and go, oh, what did they wear underneath there? Uh, they wore slips. That was the beginning of what we call the slips. But there's an example. Now, this would have been the party girl who would have worn the party hat. Can't you just see the speakeasies, the Charleston, the lights, and she'd be just dancing away. And then, um, then there came the more sophisticated 20s lady. This would have been maybe uh, a, a, obviously a dress for a party or something special. Uh, or if she was working, she could have wear, wear, worn that. This is one of my favorites though. Found this in Oberlin, Car or Kansas. This is a flapper dress. But again, just reach out your hand, uh, Lori. <laughs> you can see how heavy it is. These are metal covered beads. This is just gorgeous. But it is very heavy, so they can't get back to that weight again. But notice arms are open, their necks, their faces, their legs. In fact, instead of those big old black button up shoes, now they were wearing casual shoes, comfortable dancing shoes, because those girls were probably dancing in the speakeasies. And those of you who know your history you know the speakeasies was during the um, prohibition. prohibition. So I always laugh when I think about uh, the women and their cloches, because a cloche was worn close to the head. Now, see the contrast between my Victorian bonnet and the cloche. It fit close to their head and it came clear down to their eyebrows. 
Now, if there was someone else in here, I'd have you trying on some of these hats, but this is gorgeous. It took me three years to get this from the lady who was selling it because she didn't want to sell it. It was so unique. But when she, I assured her that I was not going to resell it, that I would show it in my shop for, as an exhibit, she finally uh, relented and sold it to me. But that is a beautiful piece. Now here's another one. This is so fun to put on young girls because see, they go back to the rosette and the jewelry again. And this of course fit way down on their uh, eyebrows. And I thought, you know, I bet I know why they did that because they were in the speakeasies and they didn't want anybody to recognize them and go home and tell their mothers. <laughs> now, this one uh, has significance to me because this was my Aunt Vera. When Aunt Vera found out I had Annie M's, she sent this to me. Now, the interesting history on her is she was born in a mining camp and grandma told me that she was born premature. And so they kept Vera alive in a wood burning stove in Victor, Colorado. Can you imagine tending a stove 24 hours a day, not too hot, not too cold for their baby. And uh, I just thought that was marvelous type of history of women, you know, to be able to, to keep a, a, an infant alive in a wood burning stove. Well, what's so interesting is my aunt lived to be 101. <laughs> <laughs> so she started out sturdy and she stayed sturdy. But Aunt Vera uh, actually lived for a while in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, her husband was a professor at KU. She said, Ann, I, didn't, I couldn't afford a cloche, so I made my own. Oh. So she made this hat for her wedding because she couldn't afford a real cloche. Okay. So now let's step a little bit further to Lori, and now we're going into a whole nother era. Um, oh, these, these two dresses are 20s. If you can see the green and the uh -huh. blue. Uh -huh. But I want you to notice the waistlines. They're tiny. And the green one actually has the original slip that went with that dress. Now, while you're here, Lori, look at these dresses. What do you see changes here? The waist disappears. Yeah, the way, well, the, that was the 20s. And yeah, the 30s, <clears throat> there wasn't as tight. But look at the length. Oh, okay. Whoops, excuse me. The 30s, everything changes again. The dress goes down. I think the 30s was the most beautiful uh, decade of fashions. The 30s women were beautiful. They had the beautiful dresses, full length. However, you can see their arms still showed, their necks still showed, but the dress went back down and the hat got big again. <clears throat> Instead of the little cloche, there was a full-size slip. All these three dresses here are 30s. Okay, we're going to step over here. Just going to make sure I got all of And then over here, you find the hats of the 30s. This one I really love. <clears throat> this is a morning hat of the 30s. And again, see, they're still kind of going back to the, the, the feathers and the jewelry, but it has the netting. Now, this was nice because she could uh, put the netting up when she was uh, approaching the church. And then when she went into the church, she'd lower the, uh, the veil and she had a appropriate morning hat. This one is one of the prettiest on if you have, I always have someone try this one on. <clears throat> now, do you notice the hat's gotten bigger than the twenties cloche? Very uh, attractive again, uh, very stylish again, trying to get back, I think, to that beautiful era of women in long dresses. And of course I try to, uh, memorialize some important women in uh, women's history. And of course, my grandmas were the ones in the early 1800s or late, excuse me, late 1800s. But I always like this hat right here, particularly 
because it reminded me of a very famous woman in our history, wife of a president. Can you guess who that is? Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor wore big hats. She was a big woman, very big woman. And unfortunately, she wasn't real attractive, but she was a tremendous intelligence leader. Uh, but she wore the heavy hat. She wore, this is her hat. And then you can see her here with her fur on. But I want to tell a story about her because as we all know, the president was ill. And so there were times in that period of time where he was the president of the United States, she actually made some of the most important decisions for the United States because he was in, incapable of doing that. But you know, she never got credit for that until later on in, after, in her life, and of course later on after she passed away, people began to realize what an impact she had on American history. Okay, so now we're going to go <clears throat> into more the uh, 40s, which <clears throat> many of us can relate to. I think of the 40s uh, during the time of my mother. So these hat, well, oh, I'm sorry, this is a 1930s wedding hat. Again, look at the lace and see the beautiful rosettes. I love this one because of the color. You didn't, I, and I want you to under, okay, <laughs> Lord, go back down this way again. Notice they're mostly black, you know, grays, browns, and colors. And then as we go down through the 40s, the 50s, then you begin to see the color. Now, this is a gorgeous hat right here. And someday maybe somebody can tell me what this material is. Um, I thought it was gauze, but I've had a couple of ladies who are very knowledgeable about fabric tell me that isn't gauze. So that's been a mystery. Here's another <clears throat> beautiful 30s into the 40s. Again, see the bow, the little rosette. Okay, now the dresses, when we go back into the 30s, you will notice, again, here's a beautiful 30s. And this one back here is one of my favorites. This has sequins uh, sewn into the fabric. You can get a close-up of it. Those are all 30s. It is just gorgeous. It's so tiny, though, that it's very difficult to have fashion shows because we can't find anybody <laughs> that can fit into them. Okay, now I want to go into the 40s. And I want you to notice what happens in the 40s. What about the dress? Shorter. Shorter. Okay, the dress goes back up. All right, it's shorter, but the hat tends to be both large and small. You're beginning to see a trend here <clears throat> in the hats uh, because it changes, but I think these 30 or 40s dresses are just gorgeous. Here's one of my favorites. See the peplum? Yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? Can't you imagine a black hat, black gloves, black shoes? They were just gorgeous. All right, now, <clears throat> of course, something drastically changes fashions in the 40s. The war. Now, we can see the change in the hats, for one thing. For instance, this is a 1940s war hat. Notice black. Of course, we are back into mourning again for the loss of our men and women during the war. But I love this little hat because she insisted on having her rosette, you know. Uh, but they were very subdued. Um, this hat is a 1940s hat. Again, you know, black, smaller, but look at the flowers. You know, she still adorned her hat. Nobody was going to take that fashion away from her. Uh, but they were very, very subdued in respect for the war effort. Now, a couple of things. This was my mother's. Oops, excuse me. My father, there's a picture of him down there, and my Uncle Fred were in the Navy. My dad was a lieutenant, and Uncle Fred was a chief medical officer. <clears throat> so when he went to war, <clears throat> and they, went, they were on submarines, my mother, back in Denver... Uh, did her part by volunteering for the Red Cross 
at the Denver General Hospital. And this is my mother's uniform. Okay, now women during the war, this really allows them to expand, to grow, uh, to come out, if I might say, because women in the factories were allowed to wear slacks or shorts. And the reason for this, obviously, is it was a safety issue. Couldn't have these women working in the factories in long dresses. So they allowed women to wear slacks and uh, shorts. This is a, a union uh, outfit. Of course, this is another one I always remember to recognize. It's Rosie the Riveter. She changed fashion. Not only was she wearing pants, but she brought the bandana. Oh. And that became popular during that period of time. Okay. And so um, then these, are, well, I don't know where even where to begin to stop, but these are all 40s dresses. Now, this one is rare. This is a Nellie Dawn. And I know there's a whole display at the K-State um, Fashion um, Department. Nellie Dawn was a designer out of Kansas City. And what made her so unique was that she began to design the simple dresses for women, practical dresses for women, for the average woman to be able to afford and be comfortable in their fashions. So this is a Nellie Dawn. And um, I hope to donate this to the K-State Fashion and Design Department when I'm ready to uh, close any ends. But this is Nellie Dawn dress. Now you see the contrast again. This is an Ola Cassini hat. Now Ola Cassini was a very, very famous designer and the clothing was very expensive. In fact, my daughter, who is a Jackie Kennedy fan, said, Mom, Ola Cassini designed Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress. So Ina Roth, who uh, once owned the Weaver Hotel here, uh, this was her hat, and it was an Ola Cassini hat. Whoop, I'm sorry, there we go. <laughs> Twirl it around, which is very rare. And so after she passed away, her daughter, Bevy Revke, gave it to me and said, I think mom would be happy to have, have you show this off. And in addition, here is a, um, let me put this back. Here is an Ola Cassini dress, very fashionable. You can see the tag says Ola Cassini. But this was for more of the wealthy women. It wasn't very practical for those of us women in rural Kansas. But if you had an Ola Cassini, it was priceless because it was very, very popular. Okay, now um, we've changed to kind of the 50s look and into the 60s. And I love this because notice the hats. Actually, there's no rhyme or reason. You know, in the earlier years, they all kind of looked alike or had the same type of pattern or same type of, of material. But, oh my gosh, the 50s and 60s came in and it was just fun. Well, you can notice, you notice up there, there's berets. There were feathered hats. There were the, the small, oh, this is another, speaking of Jackie Kennedy, of course, you know, Jackie Kennedy had the uh, beautiful uh, patterns. Uh, the one up there, uh, Lori, the pink one up there, up top, that reminds me of Jackie Kennedy. And you remember, she brought the pillbox in. So we went from the saucer hat, which was big, to the smaller hats, And the pillbox hats, whoops, I got it, that's caught. The pillbox hat was all brought in by Jackie Kennedy. This one I love, and I'm, I'm a little humble to say this, but this is a 50s hat, and it is just gorgeous. But the little lady's picture is inside, and it didn't do much for her. <laughs> she probably thought she was lovely. <laughs> But actually, that wasn't the best hat for her. But I love it because I have a picture to go with yes. that. 
So the 50s, and then you can see there's all kinds of designs and, and uh, styles in the 50s into the 60s. Um, finally, what happens is the hat becomes almost uh, diminishes, except for the Catholic ladies. And the Catholic ladies continued to wear hats in their churches. But one lady told me, she said, oh, I don't know, after a while, I just put a hanky on my head. But you can see what happens to the hat. From the big, oh, got caught on a pin here. From the big, full, wild hats, it basically disappears down to the very basic hat. And then, in the 60s, late 60s, we started ratting our hair. <laughs> you start ratting your hair and you can't wear hats. And so the hat begins to disappear. And which is kind of sad, but you can see the transition to a more modern woman, uh, freer, the fashions are uh, freer, uh, less constrictive. Uh, ex a new fabric came in, plastic came in in the 50s, so there's plastic. Um, oh, I can't, where's my plastic hat? I have hats with plastic in them. Uh, here's some of the 50s, 60s, there's, there's the poodle skirt. Uh, brownies, Girl Scouts, oh, I can remember being a brownie. Uh, Scout, the woolens, this was a knitted sweater, and I have a picture of very similar to that I found in a magazine. So they're much freer, much uh, crazy, I guess, in the 60s. You know, we just, music was popular, dancing was popular. Here's a go-go a -go, um, outfit, hot pants. You know, and we see some young girls today wearing short shorts. Well, I'll tell you what, those hot pants were shorter than the short shorts. <laughs> and then you have your 60s evening gown. This is on loan from, both of these were on loan from a friend. <clears throat> okay, now these are 60s um, prom dresses. Remember the old strapless prom dresses? All right, these were, I can remember, this is my era. I graduated in 68. Um, I'm sorry, I graduated from high school in 64, college in 68. And I can remember the prom dresses with the um, beautiful lace and lovely satin that we got to wear. <clears throat> now, <laughs> this is my mother. Then this is how I remember my mother in the 50s and 60s. These are coming back. If you notice in the catalogs, they have dresses for women, fashions now with the short sleeves, and the belt is coming back in. But these all remind me of my mother. <clears throat> then, here's the 60s, later 60s and 70s. This is what I might have worn the first year I taught school in 1968. These were the, your little suits, your uh, short skirts. Um, now notice the colors that are, are surfacing. Um, I just have to tell you this story for those of you in the museum. These are their uh, pants. Oh, help me. I just lost the... Uh, these oh. belong to Nancy Nolte. <gasps> these are her... Bell bottoms. There we go. I couldn't think. I'm sorry. I'm trying to hurry through this. These are bell bottoms. These are actually Nancy wore, <laughs> and she gave them to me. <clears throat> then there was the the leisure suits. You can remember my husband, who's a pretty rough, tough farmer, actually wore yellow leisure suits when he taught school at Valley Heights. <laughs> People can't even imagine that. Okay, look here. Things are really changing, ladies. Now we're getting into the 70s, Holy 60s. Moly. Isn't that something? Look at the big... Actually, these are pants. Culottes, or are they pants? Yeah, culottes. Could you could say they were culottes? Kind of a, a wild and crazy. You know, personally, I probably couldn't wear that. I wasn't tall. I'd be taking a nice, tall lady to wear those. <clears throat> Oh, just some variations, whoops, of 60s uh, dresses. 
This one is actually very pretty on. Notice the plastic belts. You can see the plastic coming in. Then, of course, we go to the <clears throat> 70s. And uh, that was kind of, we think about as the hippie era. Okay, here's a dress that is a 1970s dress. And my daughter, Monica, and her husband, Nolan, wore this to a retro ball. <laughs> and she got first prize <laughs> because it is an actual 70s dress. But notice the colors. Now, you see this chartreuse green, like this moo moo over here. Now, if you would have told me that our basketball players would be wearing tennis shoes or basketball shoes with chartreuse green, I would have said, you're crazy. But you can see these colors are coming back again. This was definitely a moo moo of the 70s. But you know, that was very, very comfortable to wear, very lightweight. And back here, I'm not gonna take it down, was just a pretty much a typical outfit of a hippie. You had the <clears throat> bell-bottom pants. You can see the beads. Um, the one behind it is another uh, Moo Moo, as original. Actually, that picture right next to it, that wedding dress, is uh, Carol Hood's 1970s wedding dress. And she gave me, her family gave me that. All right, notice the different shoes, the styles now. Here's original 60s go-go boots. <laughs> Again, it took me a couple of trips to Lawrence to talk a young man out of, of, of these boots. He didn't want to sell them because they're so hard to find. There's so many replicas that you can't, you know, really, you can't find the original go-go boots. But I, again, <clears throat> told him that I was not going to resell, that I wanted to use them for my uh, program on women's fashions. So he finally sold them to me. And if you would believe this, I was sitting here with ladies all around here, visiting with them about fashions, and he came walking in the door. And I just happened to be standing right here. I picked up the go-go boots and showed him, and he just put up his thumb and said, you know, Good way job. to go. Because I proved to him that I was not selling, I was displaying them. And he was on his way to Lincoln, Nebraska, and so he just came by to see my shop. And so... That was fun. Here, look at these shoes now. These are 70s. Isn't this a riot? <laughs> oh, however, I'm not sure how comfortable it would be. <clears throat> I could have resold these many times. So the young girls say, oh, I love those shoes. But those were 70s. And this was an 80s prom dress. You can see the little bit of change, a little bit fancier, going back to the lace again compared to the 60s dresses over there. Now, the last of the program, and I'm going to hurry through this too, is um, I, uh, I bought several pieces in Denver or Littleton at an antique store. I met a lady there and she had a display of hats. Of course, I had to buy the hats, you know. And uh, she was an <clears throat> airline hostess who would go from Denver to London, England. She would buy the hats in London and bring them back here and sell them. And so I said, oh, I've got to have some of those because if you don't, these are the Lady Di hats, you know, the, that were patterned after Lady Di fashions for the English women. And of course, so I always say Lady Di brought back a lot of the hat fashions. Of course, the English always wore hats. Queen Elizabeth still does wear hats. The Kentucky Derby, you see, are that still the hat. But it was Lady Di that brought back the, the classy look again in hats. And so I, um, I thought that was interesting. She said that they only, uh, Lady Di only wore a hat once and that then the milliners of London would then design the hats after that hat and sell it to the English women. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Oop. I'm gonna set this right here. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Huh. Where's my magazine? Oh, oh dear. Well, here's one. I want to show you the one, though. Nope. Oh, goodness sake, these hard on hats. I do hope you eliminate some of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, so I thought that was interesting to, to, to learn that they, um, they patterned after her uh, hats until I looked in one of my books. And there it is. Almost the same except the feather look is gone. But if you turn it this way, you'll see it's almost the same hat. And then, uh, the, the reason these I know are authentic is because inside, it either says London or the United Kingdom. So that tells you these actually came from England. And then I want to show you another hat. I did a lot of research on Lady Di. Molly did a lot of research on Jackie Kennedy because these are women who live difficult lives, very difficult, lots of pressure, stress on their lives. But they, both of them surfaced um, as leaders, as women that impacted our history. And so I do a lot of reading about them because they were unique. Unfortunately, we lost Lady Di, and of course we lost Jackie Kennedy. But these women actually stepped forward even in the stressful lives that they led and surfaced as outstanding women. Here's this hat. And then here's this hat. So you see the lady, the airline hostess, was being honest with me, told me the real stories. So all these hats up here are Lady Die hats. This one says uh, United Kingdom. This one is a gorgeous one on. Beautiful, beautiful hats. Of course, she was a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. These hats don't look that beautiful on me, but <laughs> they certainly did on, on Lady Di. So that's how I kind of end the program, when I give the program to kind of show you the resurfacing, resurfacing of the hat again. Um, but then now, of course, it's gone. Most women that come in, you know, will say, oh, I wish we could wear hats again. Uh, some of them say, oh, I don't know, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't look good in a hat. And then you put it on them, and then suddenly, oh, this is beautiful. So, um, I wish they would come back to a certain extent. Um, we do, we're too casual for hats now, but there's still the bonnet, you know, you can wear to the beach or the straw hat. Um, because there was something about putting a hat on a woman that created her own personality and just allowed her to be a unique person in her own. So I just love the history that, that goes with all these fashions, how women impacted history and how history impacted women. Done. <laughs>